In this episode, we're going to be talking about how to grow a garden no matter where you live, how big or small of a space you might have available. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Yule Acres podcast where we are rooted in nature, where we talk about taking examples from nature to implement them in our own daily lives to better help us grow and more sustainably with the aid of modern technology. We're going to be talking about gardening no matter where you live, the space available to you, whether you live in a small, tiny, high-rise apartment, a college dorm, the white picket fence in suburbia, or a small yard, even if you're lucky enough to have a large amount of land with a ranch with thousands of acres. That's what we're going to be talking about today, different scenarios that you might encounter and how you can do to amend that in order to be able to have a garden. Now, your mileage may vary in the sizes of gardens that you can grow, but that's what we're going to be talking about today, different examples, so that way, even no matter what your living situation is, you have the ability to grow. Now, looking at this particular example, you can say, well, I don't have any room whatsoever because I live in a high rise apartment building in, in New York City, lots of congested areas, and there is just nowhere to grow whatsoever. I live in a very, very small apartment studio cramped 100 square foot where just to be able to get in the door, I have to flip my bed into the wall. I don't even have a bathroom in my own apartment. We have to have all share one bathroom that's down the hall. So we have 10, 20 units all sharing one community bathroom down the hallway. I have to physically leave the place of residence where I sleep to go use the restroom. Well, you know what? I say there is still an ability that you can do that. What am I talking about? I'm talking about community gardens. Now, even if you live in New York City, there are many, many different places, and the community garden is that potential answer. Now, I'm looking at statistics with just the city of New York alone. There are over 2,000 community gardens across just the five boroughs alone. So when you're telling me I have no clothes, I have no place to grow in my own personal residence. Well, there is always one option. That is the community gardens. As people after World War II started coming back from the war, they had a little bit more money. Both the mom and the dad were working because while the men were off at war doing their things, a lot of the women came out of the home and started working a lot of the factory jobs. As men returned from war, the women that were out working said, you know what? I've been out working. I've been doing this stuff. I've gotten a taste of life of being out, being independent, and I no longer want to give that up. That's fine. Cool. We had a significant rise in two income households that was not because of necessity, but because they wanted to. With having two income households, that significantly, exponentially increased the amount of income that a nuclear family was starting to receive. With that higher income, they wanted to move out of these apartments, out of these small areas, and wanted to move out to the suburbs to have a nice house, nice picket fence. And that made a huge demographic shift between people now living in concentrated urban city centers out further down. One major consequence that this created is it started creating small abandoned warehouses, small abandoned lots throughout the entire city. Gradually over time, these buildings became derelict, they became a little bit more sad, and they started to be leveled or undeveloped or partially developed. And there was a question of what do we want to do with these abandoned lots? What do we want to do with these patch mark little areas throughout the city? They weren't really big enough to be useful for large industrial complexes. They really weren't useful for people to want to build apartment complexes or other uses out of them. 
And so a thought process came forward that we want to try and start growing our food close by. We want to rejuvenate the idea of the Liberty Garden from World War II. We want to be able to make use of this land that we have. There is a development of what we have called urban food deserts, where even though there's a large amount of people, we are struggling and having issues with getting high quality fruits and vegetables around our local areas. And the people, urban concentration centers of people are having issues of receiving good high quality food. Throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, with a massive explosion now in the 2000s, 2020s, there is more than ever before a large amount of community gardens. And what we did, at least in particular for the United States and other portions of the Western Hemisphere, we started taking these abandoned lots, areas that were not as commercially viable that people really didn't want, that had homeless populations started to develop them. They wanted to create them so they would be of a benefit to the local area. And so with that, they started to take public resources and convert them into growing spaces that would be available. Now, even in New York City, looking at just the five boroughs, they have over 2,000 community gardens, like I mentioned before. That's 2,000 separate plots of land that have been developed into being able to grow food. Some of these locations are going to be a lot less expensive than others. Now, in my particular area, I live near a major city, but yet I still live in a smaller area in the state of Utah. In my community alone, we have anywhere between 10 and 20 community gardens. I myself have a community garden that is only a three quarter mile away from me. So it is not that far of a drive or a commute in order to be able to go to these places. Now, these community gardens in most cases are not free. Now, to purchase this exact same amount of land, if you were to go traditionally and buy it, there's no way you would be able to afford it. Now, most of these gardens are funded by public funds. A lot of these are going to be through the USDA or the equivalent state agriculture program that is used to associate some funds to providing local grants for the setting up of these charities that are often going to be 503Bs, which is just a tax organization here in the United States that is set up to help fund and support this. There might be a nonprofit or some other local community that is set up to help facilitate and run these things, but they are oftentimes initially set up through grants through the local agricultural programs. Now, once they are set up, there are often a different things how they go about doing it. Sometimes they are abandoned buildings that you can do hydroponics inside. Other times, and more often the case, it's going to be some sort of an abandoned lot where you are going to either have the remaining original dirt, you can build boxes that come up because oftentimes this plot of land is going to be rubble, rock, old refuge from a construction project which is not typically going to be seen as high quality soil. So typically how part of this grant works is part of that money is used in the setup of these things where they will come in, bring in material to build grow boxes which are going to be above ground to build above the construction rubble. They will truck in soil, they'll build sides, Sometimes if you're good enough to have decent quality soil that hasn't been disturbed, then you won't do that. But the vast majority of public community gardens that I've seen have some sort of a raised bed. So that way it helps to get it above the poor soil. If not, there are some enterprising individuals that will physically do that themselves to help raise it up. Now, a lot of these are going to be subsidized for the cost as well. But for the public to use them, that is the great thing about these community gardens is they are open to the public. Anyone can come and purchase them. So if you don't have any land whatsoever, then you can come in and say, I would like to use a portion of the community garden for a season. And that's how most community gardens work is starting at the beginning of the growing season you come in and say i would like this plot of land or i would like to rent out this many plots of land and you physically rent 
that space out for a season. Now it varies on cost. In my particular local community garden, the cost is $50 for the whole season as of 2023. And what that plot size consists of is a 10 foot wide by 50 foot long plot of land. Now that is relatively cheap and much cheaper in comparison to many other community gardens that I've seen throughout the US, which I absolutely love. And with our particular plot community garden, it is actually not really hindered based on what you want. It's based on how many applicants they have. So if they have a tremendously large amount of applicants, then they will limit how many plots that you can rent. However, if they have fewer plots, then they will allow you to rent more. One of the things that I did while I was in college, trying to get a little bit going, is I wanted to sell produce at my local farmer's market. But because I lived in an apartment building, I didn't have the land necessary to grow those things. I went to my local community gardens organization and said, I would like to grow a larger amount of food. So I ended up renting out 20 plots for the entire season. In told, this was, ended up being, sorry, I take that back. It was about 10 plots. So 10 plots that are five feet by about 50 feet. So if you do the math, it ended up being several hundred square feet. In total, I believe it was about four or 500 square feet of land growing tomatoes, vegetables, things like that. Not major by any means, but it was enough to help me grow and supply a local farmer's market. And it was just to help keep my feet wet in trying to grow produce at the local farmer's market. Now, I did not make a significant amount of money. By looking at the hours, I would have been making below minimum wage, but it helped to get my foot in the door and get my feet wet. There are other different community gardens that are not going to be as lenient as this. So my particular one, as I was talking about before, is a first come, first serve. If you want to rent them, cool, go for it. We had more community gardens than people actually wanted to use, which allowed us to be much more favorable and they just wanted to fill them up. There were actually several community gardens in my local area that did not get fully rented out. And so that's how I was able to first rent out a specific amount. And then they came out and said, you know what? We still have a couple plots available. I came forward and said, I would like to get a couple more. And so I was able to rent out several more later on in the season, which I ended up planting some extra tomatoes and a few other plants that allowed me to increase the amount of produce I was able to sell at the farmer's market. So that is a really, really great way that you can grow produce. Now, $50 is on the cheap end. There's some other community gardens that I saw that were going to be three, four hundred dollars for a five foot by 20 foot plot. That's going to be very expensive. There are some other community gardens that don't do just a flat rate fee. Like there are some community gardens that are income based, meaning if you are a single person and you only make twenty two thousand dollars per year, then your cost for this plot of land is going to be $100, for example. Or if you're a three-person family making $35,000 a year, then the cost for that same plot of land would only be $75 or $60. It's going to be cheaper. And so the more people that you have and the less money that you have, the cheaper it's going to cost you to purchase that or to rent that plot of land. The fewer people you have, the more income you have, the more expensive it is going to be for you. And they try to do that to limit it so that way those that are a little bit harder up for income, those that are on the lower income bracket, they will be able to garden to help supplement their own diet. The vast majority of these community gardens are not meant to do what I did where I'm looking to grow produce in order to sell it. Most people are looking for these community gardens to grow food, to supplement their own food, to supplement their own diet in order to have a much richer, fresh fruits and vegetables. 
But in my circumstance, in my own city, that's just what it ended up being. It worked out well for me to help get in the foot in the door and wanting to grow produce and being a farmer, which is something that I've always wanted and loved doing, but did not have the land resources in order to get into it. So where does this come down to? You can tell me that you live in the smallest apartment, no room whatsoever. You don't even have standing room because you live in a small, really small apartment in the high rise in Tokyo, in New York, high rise of the five boroughs. What I say to that is go to Google and look up if there's a community garden in your local area. And I would almost bet to say that there is a local community garden in your area that will allow you to grow some produce that will give you that opportunity to grow even if you physically have no space. So that's the first area that we can grow food no matter how little or less you have. Now that we've got it settled that you can grow anywhere no matter the size of the place you live, no matter your circumstances, at least here in the United States, I would almost bet that you're going to have the community gardens with an easy transportation distance so that way you can get it. Most community gardens are going to provide tools for you and they are going to be reasonably economically affordable for the vast majority of people where if you're willing to give the trade off in time to grow your own vegetables, it will be well worth the economics in what you are able to produce to have a much better, healthier source of food for you. If nothing else, just the sheer psychological joy of growing and loving plants, which has been a lifelong passion of mine, I can guarantee you it is well worth it. You've got space. So just from the community gardens angle alone, you will be able to grow a garden. Now, let's say that you don't want to go the community garden route and you want to physically grow plants in your own apartment, your own space your own backyard let's go ahead and take a look at a few other different scenarios that you can have in order to grow now the first scenario is going to be you're in a very small tiny high-rise apartment building with just no room at all whether it's a studio one bed bedroom you're in a really cramped place you're in your early 20s whatever style of life college student just a very very cramped living space well that's simple. What I'd recommend is start with something small that you have enough room for. Most places are going to have a kitchen. Even small motel rooms are going to have a kitchenette with some sort of a counter. What I'd recommend is go and get yourself a nice little four, eight inch pot. Go ahead and put some soil in it. Decide what you want to grow. I would recommend starting with one of two things. One, I would get yourself a small little violet, a small little flower, or even some sort of a vine that can just take a lot of abuse, very low sunshine, and not much water. It's going to be very easy. It'll bring a little bit of greenery in life in your life. The other thing that I'd recommend is if you want something that's not going to be flowers for viewpoint, something that's going to be edible, I would start with an herb. Go ahead and do some rosemary, some basil, maybe oregano or thyme. Pick one of the standard for general herbs. Or if you want to make your own Italian seasoning, get yourself an 8, 10 inch pot. One corner, get some rosemary. One corner, get some oregano. One corner, thyme. One corner, go ahead and get some other type of an herb, whether it's chives or something else. Use this herb as a seasoning. You can go ahead and take a small little snippet off of it, throw it in your eggs, throw it in your whatever else that you enjoy doing. Maybe you enjoy doing some lemon herb chicken. Sprinkle it all on top. It will give you some fresh herbs and it'll give you that bug. You're not going to be in it for very expensive. Go down to your local garden store, big box store, a small little plastic cheapo, 8 inch, 10 inch pot with some sparts. You're looking at two, three dollars a piece with a little bit of soil. You're looking at getting into gardening for the 25 to 30 dollar range. It is going to be accessible and give you just a little bit of joy. Dip your foot into the water just to give you the bug, even if you have a small area. 
the biggest limiting factor that most people are going to have when you're talking about a small high-rise tiny apartment is going to be available light now most apartments things like that are going to have a window somewhere that's going to be required due to fire code due to having a secondary egress that is important most city municipalities require two entrances or exits just in case there's a fire so you're going to have your main door and then you're going to need a window back door something else in most cases for all small tiny high-rise apartments they're going to be a window get yourself a small little ikea end table or maybe it's a little bit larger of a ledge maybe you're lucky enough that you can have a window next to the kitchen countertop where you do your dishes whatever it is get this small little pot and set it near that window that way it can receive the light at night receive the light that it needs now one thing to keep in mind when you're having light come from one direct source is those plants are going to tend to lean towards the light because they want to receive where it's at so every couple days take that bowl rotate it 30 degrees 90 degrees and just give it a good quarter turn every day every couple days and that will encourage the plant to continue to grow somewhat normal otherwise you're going to have your plant bending sideways towards the light to get what it needs but that is a way that you could easily grow something even if you're in a high small tiny high-rise apartment whether you're in the five boroughs or a college student now this one is the next one. It's going to be a small townhome, duplex, or let's say that you are a younger college person or you're out on your own away from home for the first time and you're renting a house or some sort of a duplex townhome and you've got four, six people to a tiny house. Now, this particular one brings me great joy. Here is a personal story for you. In my younger years, while I was a college student, I absolutely loved and wanted to grow things. Even though I worked at the university greenhouses for a period of time, I was able to grow a lot. I had stuff there, but I wanted to grow plants in my own apartment. But I really didn't have a room. I had some roommates that were highly allergic to different things. And so what I ended up doing is I decided to build my own greenhouse in my own closet bedroom and that's one thing you can do as a college student as someone with a smaller apartment that i personally did when it comes to the townhome duplex scenario that we're talking about typically when you're dealing with the studio apartment you really don't have this option of dedicating some of your closet space to growing plants but when you start to get into a townhouse duplex typically they're going to give you a little bit more closet space that's what I chose to do with my next place that I lived was in this townhome. So we lived in a townhome. There were four of us combined in this place. It was four bedrooms, two bath, and each of us had our own bedroom. And the closet was big enough that I could grow something in there, but the room itself really didn't allow for it. So I decided to take a part of my closet and dedicate it to growing space. So what I did is I decided to build my own rack growing system. I went down to lo my local big box store. This one happened to be Home Depot, but in all honesty, whether it's Ace Hardware, Lowe's, whatever it is, they're going to generally have these supplies. I went and I bought some one inch PVC pipe. I went and bought two shop lights that were T8s. I bought some electrical wire, some other things that I already had. And I took this one inch PVC pipe, made a box together, glue it together, making some shelves with multiple tubes together. And then I got some zip ties and I physically zip tied shop lights to the top of this rack system that I built with two shelves. This shelf ended up being approximately four feet tall. So I would have the bottom shelf, two feet, zip tied some shop lights to it. And then I ended up building another two feet up above it, zip tied some more shop lights to it. And then I just got some simple daylight, you know, five, 6,000 plus Kelvin lights that they had there and I brought them in. It was absolutely glorious. So I decided I'm growing some herbs. I grew some onions. I grew some other stuff in there too. 
Well, my roommates saw me growing these items, and they joked that I was illegally growing stuff. Well, through various girls that I would date or other things, it came out and about from different things that I had a homegrown mini greenhouse in my closet. Well, you know where this story is going. I had the cops called on me saying that I had an illegal grow of marijuana, marijuana, which in my particular state that I live, not only then, but still now, it is illegal to grow marijuana without a license. You have to have special licenses approved by the U.S., um, by my state's ag department in order to grow it. I could not grow for personal use or anything like that. So I had to, and these cops went, got a warrant, came into my apartment and observed it. I can't tell you the shock on their faces when they saw this weird college student that decided to grow herbs and onions in their closet. They said that this was an absolute first for themselves and their department, and they didn't know how they would go about writing it up that they got a call for marijuana grow in a college student's house where it ended up that he was growing basil, rosemary, and onions. It was an absolute first in this college town for this. So if you go to grow these things, keep in mind, don't be surprised that your roommates may get a little suspicious about what you're growing in your closet. But that's what I ended up doing in this particular townhome that I lived in at the time. On that happy note, we are going to go ahead and move on to our next segment, which is question of the day. Now, today's question has been submitted by John Humphrey 99, who asks, I'm going to be going on vacation for the next three weeks. I have some brand new strawberry starts that are going strong, but yet I'm going to be going out of town. And so I'm concerned that they may not get the water they require for three weeks. Is there anything I can do to water them to keep them going? If it helps, a lot of these strawberries are placed in terrariums in hopes that it may help in retaining water. Well, Thank you for submitting that question, John Humphrey 99. And there is a simple and a complicated answer to that. The simple answer is there are some things that you can do to attempt to water them, but that large amount of time, you're honestly kind of up a creek. When you're dealing with a terrarium, especially with strawberries, they like their feet wet but well draining soil if you have them sitting in water then they're going to be turning into potential issues with root rot crown rot and other potential issues so you got to be careful with strawberries with it being in terrarium there is a higher prone possibility that they're going to have their feet wet if you just try and dump a whole bunch of water in them and have it last for three weeks straight one of the ways that you can try and help mitigate this is you can take them out of the terrarium or you can keep them in a terrarium but give them some sort of a slow release water system one way that you can do this is that's probably going to be easy is going to be taking some sort of a large jug two liter bottle fill it up with water poke a couple holes in the lid screw it on tight flip it upside down and let that water drip slowly into the soil and percolate through the soil with the strawberries. That might help you out, but that's gonna give you a week, two weeks at most worth of water. And so you're gonna need a really, really big jug and really small holes so that way it can work, which you can jerry rig that. I mean, go get yourself a five gallon jug and set it up to do it. That's very possible. But that kind of gets into the scary zone of if your water is dripping too much, then it's going to make the soils boggy and it could cause to have that root rot, crown rot issue. So if you are going to go with that method before you go on vacation, test it out and see how it works. The next way that you can go about doing that is the question of is your plants indoors? If they're outdoors, one of the things that you can do is you can go down to your local big box store, you can buy a battery operated timer or get some sort of a 
There's new apps now that you can get, like Beehive is one of them, where you can set automatic timers so you that you can control from your phone. So take your hose, screw it into that, use irrigation wire, you can use solenoids, and have it activate. Or if you're just using your hose, you can screw the hose end into it, turn the water on, and it will automatically open up the valve for a specific amount of time every single day. By having that, you can connect it to a drip irrigation system and let it trickle into your strawberries or whatever plant you're using. If all goes well, then you're going to have water that is going to slowly drip for a specific amount of time. The only issues you've got to be concerned about is if your water gets shut down or if your more likely scenario, your water gets too much water. So those are a couple of the things that you could potentially do to help water the plants. In all honesty though, me personally, what I've always done is if I'm going out on vacation, I'm going to set up automatic watering systems to do most of the legwork. However, I'm always going to employ a neighborhood kid, a family friend, a family member, in order to come in, check on my house while I'm gone anyway. They're checking the mail, they're mowing the lawn, they're doing these other things to help us to make certain that the house looks livable while we were out on vacation. But while they're there, have them water the plants, have them check up on things, make sure things are going good. That's going to be the safest way to go about doing it. Go ahead, try set up your automated systems, whatever you want to do, but you know what? Have a family friend come and look on the house. For security purposes, you probably may be doing that anyway with such a long period of time that you're out of the house, so why not have them do double duty in that as well? If you wanna pay them, pay them to help look after it, or if you're like some of my buddies, they really don't like cash, they prefer payment in beer and whiskey. So occasionally if they're coming over, I'll hand them over a case or two of beer as payment, and they absolutely love that. So that is some of the thought process that I'm thinking of, of how to help you when you're watering your plants, in particular John's strawberries when he's going out on vacation for a three week period of time. So thank you so much, John Humphrey 99 for your question submission today. Another thing that you can do is a lot of townhomes, a lot of duplexes, they're gonna have a small porch. They're going to have a small patio area that you can go out the back that's going to allow you a little bit more room than just your standard eight, 10 inch pot. What you can do is go and get a 15, 25 gallon pot, maybe a little bit larger or multiple small pots and put plants in them. Whether it's a tomato, you've got a few other things that allows you to grow a little bit wider. Now we are moving on to the suburban house with a white picket fence. By doing this, this is going to allow you a much greater variety of growing. You're gonna have a backyard, you can do some raised garden beds, you can continue to do pots, whether you wanna do plastic, whether you wanna do clay terracotta. The larger house is going to allow you a much greater space that you can grow in and I say go for it even if you're in a house that is a rental that you are not allowed to tear up the yard to make installations that's okay you can still grow for much of my life I have lived in rented houses in rented places that were not my own there's very few times in which I have lived in properties that I had the ability to make major modification to because I didn't own it. So that's one of the things that I did is you take some good 15, 25 gallon pots. And if you wanna grow larger things like tomatoes, if you wanna go on cheap, go down to your local big box store, buy some five gallon buckets, drill some holes in it so that way the water can drain out, buy yourself some bags of soil, and that will allow you to grow some of these plants that typically take up a larger amount of space, but will give you a tremendously large amount of produce. One thing that I did is I absolutely love zucchini. I love zucchini bread. So I would take a five gallon bucket, plant one zucchini plant, and I would get enough zucchini from one plant to not only supply myself, but also supply my entire neighborhood. You won't believe how much zucchini one plant will produce. 
go and get yourself one or two tomato plants. You get a good cherry tomato plant that will give you enough tomatoes to last the entire season to your heart's desires. Even if you want small little slicer tomatoes, I say go with a cherry tomato. That gives you little cherry tomatoes that you can put in your salads. You can dice them up real small, put them on sandwiches. If you want to get bigger slicer tomatoes, go for it. Get yourself several five-gallon buckets. That way you can grow multiple different things. The main importance is grow what you're going to eat. Grow what you love. If you love flowers and you want beauty, go for it. If you want to have a little bit more of some produce to supplement your own food source, go for it. It is going to utterly help improve your... Uh. This is just my own personal opinion, but being able to grow, being outdoors is bringing a joy in life that is not much surpassed by other things, other than maybe a good dog chilling in your lap, scratching him while gardening, while watering the plants, while listening to a good podcast or reading a good book. Me personally, one of the best pastimes that I have is on a cool summer evening, I've got my book out or a podcast that I'm listening to while I'm able to look at that garden and say, you know what? I made that. I'm eating stuff out of there that I produce. Those flowers are gorgeous. It's just something that I absolutely love to do. You can't beat it. Now, we're going to be moving on to a little bit larger of a scenario where you are going to be dealing with a homestead. So you're growing, you've got a homestead. That's absolutely great. When you're dealing with larger properties, now when I say homestead, I'm talking about a third acre to five acres. It gets a little bit larger. The more land you have, the more capital you have, the more options it gives you. And that's kind of a no-brainer, hello. The more land you have, typically you can start to move from subsistence farming and you can start to move into selling to help supplement your hobby, your habit of growing, which is perfectly fine and great. But once again, not everyone is going to be lucky enough to enjoy those things. Many people are going to be limited by the space that they can grow. And so because of that, there's been products that have been coming out to help aid us in being able to grow. Mentioned a little bit earlier of getting a nice standard 8, 10 inch pot. Well, there's other things that have come out in recent years that are even better to give us more room. When we typically think of room, we typically think, for me personally, I think horizontally. What can I grow horizontally to increase my food sources? We as gardeners, we typically think outwards rather than upwards. Well, there are a few things that you can do to grow upwards that don't involve trellises. Over the last couple of years, there's become a huge increased interest in towers. So these are plastic pots that typically look like four leaf clovers that you can stack on top of each other. Or you have your traditional strawberry terracotta pot that has the little bulbous that look like small little decks patios where you can fit 12 15 plants in one terracotta plant these are typically marketed for strawberries or leafy greens now these towers are absolutely wonderful and this is a great space saving device that can increase the amount of grow that you can do in a very small limited space in particular i've used these before and they're absolutely great i love them the four leaf clover plastic stacking pots. How they work is you have the bottom part filled with soil. Then you have four locations in the north, south, east, west quadrants that you're able to grow. Now, I would recommend using these for a small herb, lettuce, leafy greens, spinach. If you like doing it, some Swiss chard, maybe even strawberries. That's where these things really excel small berries or like the strawberry 
or small leafy greens that have a smaller root system that will grow downward diagonally that can handle a little bit more abuse that are going to be a short term crop high rotation that's where these really shine so you have the bottom layer then you have the next four leaf clover rotate it 90 degrees so the corner is not blocked by the other four leaf clover and the other ones go in the crook of the other 90 degrees and then you're going to continue to have the four leaf clover alternating 90 degrees back and forth from each other allowing you to stack these four five six high you're going to be able to get different heads of lettuce one thing that i've done in the past is you're not always able to eat 12 heads of lettuce at one time so if that's something you want to do here's what you could do bottom layer plant four lettuces wait a week second layer plant four lettuces wait a week third level plant four lettuces wait a week and alternate doing planting four levels once a week by the time you get to level five level six that lettuce on the bottom row is going to be ready to harvest because it typically takes 30 to 60 days depending on the weather to harvest those and by that point in time you're going to be able to have fresh lettuce every single week rotating it same thing if you want to do spinach if you want to do another leafy green alternate it so you can have a little bit every week rather than getting your whole harvest all at once better yet alternate it level one maybe you got some long-term herbs that you want to grow in there next level you get some chives or some other type of herb in there maybe you want to throw in some garlic as you get a little bit higher throw in some leafy greens alternate what you're growing in that to get the best grow so as you're stacking this thing you've got a pot that physically takes up a two foot by two foot space but yet you're getting enough produce that would typically require 30 40 50 square feet of growing space it's very space economical in terms of that now these devices that i'm talking about you can expect to pay anywhere in the 30 40 dollar range then you add your soil so you're looking at 50 60 bucks the nice thing about this though is a lot of people will don't you have to water every single layer layer and it gets concerned no that's the best part about this thing is there is a hole in the center that percolates down or trickles down through all the other levels so all you got to do is water that top layer and that water will trickle down every single layer watering all the layers below it making it much more efficient too so if you live in a high-rise apartment or you've got a small deck and you want to grow lots but you only have a very solid space get yourself a four-leaf clover tower and you can really maximize your space now some of the items that we've talked about here if you like them whether it's the four leaf clover or you're looking at an 8 10 inch pot maybe a little bit of soil go ahead and look in the description down below i went ahead and threw down some of the links of silent of the items that we talked about in this podcast just to help you out now if you were to go to amazon and buy these items that i've got linked down below it is going to be the exact same price as if you were just to go do it yourself but a little shameless plug for myself if you do click on the link if you do do that i will earn a very small commission and that will help to support this channel and so that way i can continue to do great podcasts like this so if that's something you feel like doing great i would absolutely love it and also if you really like and enjoy what we're doing whether you're looking listening to us on spotify apple another podcast or even the youtube channel itself please give us a like a review it also helps us out with the algorithm so that way we can share this information with others and absolutely continue to progress this knowledge so that way we can learn each other from each other now looking at this things we are looking at the utmost important thing here of this entire subject of how to grow in a space no matter where you live whether you've got a big space small space the number one most important thing to do is get out there learn grow do what you can but remember the number one most important thing is you have no excuse of my space is not big enough remember 
The community garden is an absolutely wonderful, great resource that is open to the general public. Anyone can go do it for $50, You can rent a nice, good, solid space for the entire season to grow what you want to grow. There is no excuse. If you've got the motivation, if you've got the time and desire to grow something, go hit up that community garden and grow what you love to eat, grow what you love to look pretty, take some cuttings of those flowers that you've grown, some carnations, put them in a vase, and beautify up that small, dingy, sad studio apartment, and dream of days when you can increase the amount of growing space that you have of Thank you so much for joining us today on this podcast and please stay tuned for our next podcast that we have coming out that's going to be taking a look at pollinators. In particular, we're going to be talking about honeybees, what the true cost of it getting into. Some people are going to be looking at honeybees and saying that is too big expense of a hobby. Well, what we're going to be doing is going through the weeds and identifying what are true needs in beekeeping and what are things that are nice to have but still get the job done. We are going to be looking at the absolute true cost of what it really takes to be a beginner beekeeper to get into it. So look forward to that next podcast coming out and we look forward to seeing you next time.